All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, Control Booth's second session of uh, the All week right. with Nan. Good afternoon, and, everyone. And All right. Welcome Good to, afternoon, uh, everyone. Control Booth the music to, uh, Control experience. Booth's second. I am your moderator, Ethan Gilson, and this is the inter in eh, the failure to be able to tell articulate apparently the entering entertainment charting your course into industry. Um, Again, I, uh, I'm your moderator, Ethan Gilson, with Entertainment Rigging Services, and I host a podcast called Shackle, Burlap, and Lies. And today we have a slightly different panel from yesterday, and so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And we'll start with Mr. Uh, David. We'll hit uh, David, Alicia, then Michael, and then Mike. Hi, I'm David Silvernail, and I run controlbooth.com. I also am the e-commerce manager for uh, production advantage or proadv.com, which is powered by Vincent Lighting Systems. Hi, I'm Alicia Hollitz. Um, I am a associate project manager for Universal Creative. Um, we work developing live entertainment attractions for Hi, Universal I'm theme parks. Um, and if you're not sure what a live entertainment attraction might be in a theme park, it's uh, parades, um, Broadway style, short. Um, live shows, uh, lagoon shows, fireworks, projection shows, um, and then some smaller street type shows. Hi, I'm Mike Trudeau. I am the assistant master electrician at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. Um, I also serve as the master electrician for the University of Illinois at Chicago um, for their productions in their theater department. Hi, I'm Mike Nikolai with uh, TLC Engineering Solutions. I'm a uh, theater and uh, acoustics consultant, um, doing a combination of both uh, systems consulting and architectural consulting. Um, and I uh, also have both a, a theater and an AV integration background. Right. So uh, this session is kind of a, a build off of yesterday's session. If you are viewing and you didn't view yesterday's, you can actually find that on the Control Booth YouTube page. A um, couple of uh, housekeeping items I want to mention. If you logged on to watch this through the NAM Believe in Music portal, you probably want to click on the YouTube logo and view it directly on YouTube because that will give you the ability to use the chat function and ask us questions and interact with us. Um, the other thing is it's uh, scheduled for a 60 minute session. Yesterday we went over. So if you have to leave at the end of the 60 minutes, we certainly understand. But if we're having a good, good conversation, we'll uh, stick around a little longer and answer questions if we can. So, uh, where do we want to start? Do you want me to ask a question that we kind of prepped and trying to pump that way? Excellent, wonderful, everyone's shaking their heads. All right, so here's kind of a, a generic question, which is, as people are entering this industry, what are some of the benefits of internships? For, for me, it was uh, the ability to get a lot of exposure to things that um, that don't get necessarily uh, discussed in college, um, whether that's because the uh, program isn't equipped to address those things or um, because of the, the sheer lack of time and being able to do that. Um, you know, I had the, the good fortune of having some internships both with uh, ETC as well with uh, as with a uh, AV uh, design build integration firm. And when I was with the AV firm, uh, we were in the process of growing, which meant there wasn't enough desk space. So I spent a period of about six months working in the boss's office. And you learn a lot about the business side um, and day-to-day -day company management and design management and team management um, when you get that kind of exposure that uh, college it, simply cannot offer in the way that an internship can. 
on a similar note, um, for me, it was, you know, getting exposure to a type of live entertainment that you really don't with a theater degree. Um, so my main internship was with Universal um, and I was able to learn, I, starting my internship, I had never been to Universal before. I've never been to a Universal theme park. I've been to Disney once and that was really all of my experience with theme parks. So being able to learn how operations of a theme park works, how we develop these live attractions um, and just realizing if I like the company or not. Do I like live, uh, live entertainment in theme parks? Is this how I want to move forward with my career? Um, and then I was able to actually get a full-time job out of my internship. Um, so that's something else with internship is timing wise. Like if you have a company you really want to work for like towards the end of your education or maybe right after you graduate intern with that company and that way you can decide without fully committing if you will really want to work for them and then hopefully um, that gets your foot in the door to a, a full-time position. Uh, my internship experience was uh, with a summer stock directly out of college. And uh, the nice thing about that was they were, the way that they run things, you were able to work on multiple aspects of shows. So you could kind of experiment if you didn't really know what you wanted to do. Um, uh, the other thing that was nice about that is, like Alicia said, um, that led to me being hired on as their master electrician for the following six summers. So um, they're an organization, um, they love to promote from within, as I'm sure a lot of organizations do. So, um, which leads to uh, the main thing that I got out of that internship was connections. Um, a lot of the, so this was uh, a summer stock theater up in Door County, Wisconsin called Peninsula Players. Um, and they bring up a lot of uh, artists from Chicago, some from New York, some from Milwaukee, but Chicago is their main draw from. So once the internship ended, um, I was able to take advantage of those connections when I decided to move to Chicago to pursue my theater career. So one of the things that you mentioned, Alicia, is that in your internship, you were exposed to a side of the industry that you had not, A, been exposed to, but maybe even had thought of is in terms of a career path. So the question is, how important as you are entering the industry, how important is um, your ability to be flexible and to kind of shift or to up date your plans as opportunities present themselves? I think it's very important to be flexible. Um, keep your, your options open when it comes to what you wanna do and what, what the possibilities are. Um, like I said, I, like a couple months even before starting with Universal, I had no idea theme parks was a thing I could do with my degree. Um, I, I searched online for an internship and Universal popped up and I applied. And that's just kind of how it happened. Um, you know, uh, being flexible with um, your options is just, I don't know, <laughs> I guess it's just important. Um, I guess this past year, especially with uh, the pandemic and everything, I think it's become very apparent um, in this industry, it's that you need to be flexible. You need to find, um, sometimes you need to find other ways to use your skills um, in other industries. Um, we're gonna take a, a question, which is, um, what about interning not right out of school or more so from a current professional job, can you speak to who overcoming the challenges associated with paying bills while trying to switch careers? I think that brings up a great bit of information, which is people tend to think of internships as being directly tied to academia, that, you that only students pursue internships. And we know that's not the case. There are a lot of situations where there are paid internships. The 
there are, again, there are different requirements based on where you are, both state and federally, but internships are designed to help employees or potential employees learn about the industry. Um, and specifically, they're not supposed to be a job that that business would normally be paying someone to do. And if it is, then they also have to pay you. Um, so I don't know if any of you have any specific thoughts because I don't know if any of you have actually, you know, tried the interning off of a professional career, but um, maybe the, the environment's the same where we can talk about interning and being compensated for your time while being an intern. I mean, I, I, I would say that at any point in your career, um, you know, whether it's a formal internship or, or not, um, it's important to uh, surround yourself with people who you can learn from um, and keep learning from. And, um, you know, uh, in, in, in my entire uh, career, traje career trajectory, starting in high school, going through college, um, uh, going through the internships I went through, and then um, the AV design job, and now a uh, systems consulting job, you know, each one of those positions, the, the success of them was based on uh, being around people and specifically having people above me in the food chain uh, who believed in me and were willing to give me uh, latitude to try things and invest in me, um, both from a time perspective and from a financial perspective. Um, and, you know, having uh, that support structure has, has really helped my career grow. And I feel like if I had stayed working in more of a resident theater position um, that um, that would have would have stunted my career growth uh, because uh, particularly where I come from which is southeast Wisconsin you know most of the situations I would have had in that environment would have been situations where I would have probably been a in maybe a technical director role and there's you know nobody then for me to learn from and grow my career with um, so I think it's important to, to, you know, set yourself up in a position where, you know, you do have this ability to sort of learn by osmosis. Yeah, just chiming in with that. Um, I know, at least with the theme parks and some other internships, because of that thought that internships associate directly with education, a lot of them require you to be in school. Um, so if you're not in school, it actually can be a little bit more difficult to find those internships. But as Mike was saying, um, if you have your network and your connections, you can partner with someone who can help you develop the skills you want to develop or in the industry you want to develop um, your skills in um, and, and move from there. See if there's any help you can do. I know financially sometimes that's not not the best situation, but um, but uh, I guess that's how you grow sometimes. Yeah, I would add that there's a lot of training opportunities in the industry, like organizations like NAM and USITT and LDI. There, there are going to be people there that are able to point you in the right direction at the very least, or able to uh, offer you a training session, like on any product, like you can go to a provider, like main stage or something like that, and they will, they will set up training sessions for you if you ask for it, um, that sort of thing. And in, you know, in terms of you know the the main stages of the world, um, you know, or the ETCs or the Barbizons or the whatever, uh, you know, it's important to remember that they need talent too. Um, you know, uh, it it's very easy to get this kind of you know narrow sense of what theater is, and that you know theaters being in a dimly lit room um, until all hours of the night and 
can be that uh, quite frequently, but there are a lot of related career paths, uh, you know, whether you're doing what Alicia is doing with uh, uh, theme parks, um, you're working for uh, a rental house or a roadhouse, um, if you're working for a manufacturer or a vendor, uh, you know, it, a lot of times these places may not necessarily have a job opening, but they may want somebody with a relevant skill set who uh, they can train into, you know, maybe a sales position or applications engineering position, um, you know, and they're just sort of waiting for that match to come along. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's good to reach out to those uh, uh, those different avenues, even if you don't see something posted on their website, you know, you know, start putting out feelers and saying, hey, do you, do you know if there's something, you know, here are my interests, you know, uh, what, what might be available for me? So we got a question, which I'm really excited to be able to ask, because it's actually very similar to a question that we thought of posing to ourselves as we were putting this session together, which the question is, how important was your college education when diving into the world entertainment industry? And to give you an idea, um, Logan, who asked that question, our question was, is college education, is a college education necessary and appropriate for getting into this industry? So let's kind of talk about that subject. I know, and I, I talk about this in my podcast, I started as a lighting person. I went to Emerson College and got a degree in lighting design. Um, I'm a gearhead, and it took a few years for me to recognize I was kind of a hack lighting designer. Like, I could do it. I had a huge issue with color theory, but I was a gearhead, and I love math. And so I kind of pivoted back to rigging, and that's where I excelled at. So do I use my, my college education? I do, there are certain things from college that I use as a rigor, but it's not what I went to college for primarily. So let's talk about the, the, the benefits and maybe some of the, you know, over uh, exaggerated benefits of attending university before getting in the industry. Uh, for me, um, I didn't start getting into theater until my junior year of high school. Um, and in those two years before college, you know, I, I volunteered for all these different things. I, I tried to do every show I could and all that stuff, but um, I really felt like I didn't know about theater and like all of the workings of it enough to just go out into the world. So that's why I decided to go to college for theater so that I could develop that knowledge in a setting where I can make mistakes and it's going to be okay. Um, and it's not going to cost, you know, a company all these, all this money. Um, but I know after um, spending, I actually spent five years in college. I, I double majored in theater design technology and then um, arts management. Um, the whole reason I ended up at Universal is because they saw I had all that experience with both the management and administrative side of theater and then the technical and design side. And that's why they liked me for the position at Universal. Um, so looking back at it, I'm really glad I went to college. Um, I think in my experience, I needed to, um, but that may not be the case for everybody. Yeah, I, uh, I'm kind of in the same boat. Like I, I think college gave me a good base knowledge of what I needed. Um, I, like Ethan, went to school for lighting design. Um, and that's what I thought I was going to be doing out of college. But um, a lot of times it's kind of hard to break into that world. And starting out and needing to make a living took precedence. <laughs> um, so I ended up uh, being an electrician, mostly in Chicago. Um, as well as being a technical director. So that goes back to the flexibility of like, you should always have some other skills like in your pocket so that you can fall back on if you need to. Um, but I also realized that like Ethan, I 
wasn't the best lighting designer either. And I more enjoyed just putting the shows up. So that's where uh, my trajectory has gone. Um, I think I'm probably the only one here who didn't actually go to college um, and end up in a technical uh, field. I, I went to college for IT um, and ended up through a variety of reasons of dropping out of college and ending up doing retail sales of high-end camera equipment for many years and eventually ended up building up an entire e-commerce department and now I've transitioned over to doing e-commerce in the industry uh, selling all the fun gear that we all love to use and so, so I, I will say it's a there, there are so many paths um, to the industry and uh, there's there's a number of uh, people, uh, even on the control booth site, who have gone to college for a variety of different things and are participating in the industry from other avenues. Um, they may not have gone to college for lighting or audio or any of the technical or artistic sides of the business. Um, I know one of them has an electrical engineering degree um, and now is pursuing a doctorate in uh, color science and then uh, another member of the site got his uh, degree in radio engineering and now works for sure so it's I mean there's there's all sorts of paths through the industry depending on what your interests are and you know it, it's more than just staying in production you've got your You've got your sales, you've got your R&D side, uh, support, uh, business, marketing, all sorts of encompassing um, professions and industries that enable our production environment to run. You know, I mean, you can get out to something like J.R. Clancy and um, Wenger. Uh, who you know make chairs for the theater, you know, amongst other things. But I mean, all sorts of different uh, ways that you can you can enter the industry: carpentry, scenic design, um, tool making. It just it goes on and on. But every one of these roles is is instrumental in some way or shape or form for making a production happen. Whether it's the equipment. The marketing, the business, the finance, uh, spendables, sales, you name it. Um, there's so many ways you can stay in the industry without having to have gone to college directly for that. Um, and you don't even have to go to college at all. Um, so there, there's so many paths in the industry. I know some pretty big names who never actually went to college and have ended up in the top of their field. It's it, so I, I, I won't say that college is a must. I'll never tell somebody that there are industries where it helps a lot. You want to get into serious R&D a degree in electrical engineering or something like that would help a lot. But there are certainly a, a multitude of paths and everybody here has a unique story of how they managed to get into the industry. Um, well, they stumbled upon it because somebody said, hey, you want to make some money, you know, pushing boxes? Uh, and it grew from there. Or it just, there's a, there's a million different stories in the industry of how they everybody arrived. And very few stories are the same. So uh, I, I, I strongly encourage you that if this is what you want to do, pursue it. And But there is no set formula. So this is a, a good question. Um, if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you do instead? And how do you think you would get there? I want to expand on that. How do you think you would get there? And what tools have you learned in your current position that you think you would keep in your tool bag moving forward? Are there things that are not just business related, but are life related? that would help you make that transition? And I think that's a very poignant question given the 
number of people in our industry who have had to make that decision, whether it was by choice or circumstance. I mean, I, I think there's certainly, you know, a variety of, of jobs that I could be doing that are, you know, one or two sidesteps away from what I'm, I'm currently doing. Um, you know, uh, I'm, my, you know, day-to-day -day work tends to exist somewhere between uh, um, architectural design and, um, you know, quasi-electrical low-voltage engineering. And, um, you know, if the entertainment industry, you know, collapsed tomorrow, uh, you know, uh, I could sidestep into either of those uh, pretty smoothly. Um, and I, I think that a lot of a lot of roles within the industry, the skill sets are are applicable to to related fields, you know, by a degree here or there. You know, if you're a scenic painter or scenic designer, well, you're you're not far off from being an interior designer, except you know, the the audience is going to be a little bit closer to the to the finishes that you're working with. Um, you know, now that said, I still can't imagine myself doing anything other than what I'm currently doing. Um, you know, it it uh, it's something that I've learned about myself. Uh, you know, over the last 10 years that, um, you know, I'm, I'm so passionate about what I'm doing. That I, I have a hard time imagining myself not being engaged in the industry. Yeah, I would agree. There's, like Mike said, there's so many skills that can transfer over to other career paths by just a slight tweak. Um, I think now if like mike said the industry evaporated tomorrow um i would probably look into like residential and commercial electrician line of work sort of thing um just because that's what i know and what i do um and i've also found that interesting like i've thought off and on about doing a apprenticeship just randomly with an electrician to learn more about that field and to expand my own knowledge. Um, I think that uh, having or like having the connections uh, is what really keeps me in the industry, like just the people that I've met and have enriched my life in so many ways. Um, like, I don't think I would trade that for anything. Yeah, going off of what both of you have said so far, um, I can't imagine myself doing something outside of the industry or outside of the arts for that fact. Um, I mean, I, I could say I would go manage an art gallery or a museum or something like that. Like that sounds interesting and something I'd like to do, um, but that's still in the arts. I mean, if the arts totally disappeared, I mean, technically even like interior design, that's kind of arts too, you know? Um, I think you can find the arts in a lot of places. Um, they're, they're literally everywhere. If we got rid of them, there would pretty much be nothing. Um, <laughs> uh, but but what I would do, um, I actually began college with a double major in interior architecture. So uh, I would probably go along that interior design route, um, like Mike was saying. Um, but instead of doing that, I decided just to stick to scenic design. <laughs> um, I forgot what I was gonna say. No, oh, yeah, I'll move on. Um, before I ask or I pose the next question, I'm going to remind people who are viewing, if you're viewing through the, the NAM site, you can click on the YouTube thing and you can have access to the chat where you can ask questions. Just reminding people since we're halfway through the time. Um, we got a question, which again, I feel great about because it was very similar to one of our questions that we posed. So instead of asking their question, I'm going to pose it, which is, um, is it okay 
to not know what you want to be when you grow up? And how do you deal with that not knowing or those self doubts? It's, it's uh, completely okay. And it's, uh, it's healthy. Um, you know, it's, it's healthier to accept that you won't always know the path that you, you want to be on than convincing yourself that you figured it out and then you stick hard line to that um, to a degree of which it makes you uncomfortable when uh, you begin to question whether or not you should be on that path. Um, you know, I, my trajectory into uh, college was I really wanted to be um, a theater design manager. I made my security deposit to, uh, to Millican University. And for anyone who, who doesn't know about Millican University, the process for applying and getting in there is complicated if for no other reason that you have to drive like 10 hours into cornfields to get there multiple times. So the commitment for like applying is like it's a process. And I had made it quite a long far into that process uh, before I got a little bit scared and I was like, oh, I need a legit uh, degree um, because I don't want to schlep across the country and, you know, uh, live like a nomad. I, I wanted a little bit more uh, stability in my lifestyle. So I went into electrical engineering. I did for about two years and was miserable because uh, you can only take so many calculus classes in a row and not get the kind of hands-on experimentation that you get with theater. And um, it, it just drove me insane. And um, you know, one of the, the happiest points of my college experience was when I got my transfer paperwork accepted to move back over to a theater program where I then spent the next three years. Um, and, you know, ever since then, I know a lot more about myself and what motivates me and what doesn't motivate me. And the illusion of doing something uh, that's a legit line of work, uh, now has no motivation for me. I mean, it. it uh, I need to be doing stuff that, uh, you know, it, it draws me in. And I'm passionate about for some reason or another. Now, sometimes I have to work out how I'm passionate about those things. Um, you know, different projects are exciting for different reasons. But, um, you know, there's, there's always that curiosity going into those about, you know, what what's it going to be this time? And, you know, that path is kind of ever changing. The important thing is just to know that, um, that that's okay. Don't lock yourself in because you feel you have to for some reason that's completely outside of your control. Uh, so to be honest, I never knew what I wanted to do. And if I thought I did, it changed every six months. Like I was in high school and I loved art. So I was gonna be an artist or an art teacher or something. And then I was like, but I hate sitting down and just working on one thing for a million hours. You know, I didn't like that. And then I got introduced to theater and I was like, hey, this is pretty cool. I can design things, I can hand it off. Other people can build it. That's awesome. <laughs> like, um, and like, I wasn't sure exactly what in theater though I wanted to do. I liked stage management, but I also like scenic design. Um, so that's the whole reason I picked the the degree and the school that I did um, because I could get a broad education in everything that is theater tech um, and then go out into the world and really just decide, okay, what path do I wanna go down now? Um, I can go do scenic design or I could do props or you know, I got my arts management degree also so I could go um, be a, an administrator in a, in a theater or really I, I, I gave myself the education so I had the options to change my mind later on. I knew I wanted to do the arts. I knew I was a creative person and I liked the management side also. So I, I made sure to get that education um, so I could have the options down the line to change if I wanted to. Um, I even at one point was like, okay, I'm gonna go to grad school for scenic design 
And then it was like one semester away from graduating. And I was like, uh, nope, just kidding. I'm going to stay another year and get another degree. Like, <laughs> like I, I had that moment and I'm really glad I did because I wouldn't be where I am now. Yeah, I think you just have to be open to any possibility that comes along. Like I, I graduated from college the next day. I was, had packed up my car for five months and I drove four hours to my internship. When that ended, I moved straight to Chicago. While I was there, I got hired on at the same summer stock. So I was packing my car up every year in May and driving four hours back to my summer stock. Five months later, I'd pack up my car again, like, and move back to Chicago for the winter. Like, I never in a million years expected that my life would be so nomadic for <laughs> lack of a better word for six years. But I mean, that's what it was. And I enjoyed doing it. Like I met all these amazing people, gained a lot of good skills both in Chicago and at the summer stock. So you just have to be open to whatever life is going to throw at you because it's never predictable. Um, yeah, the question was, it's not okay to know what you want when you grow up. Uh, my wife would tell you I've never grown up. So there's that. Uh, uh, you have to find something that's going to make you happy. If you're miserable, you need to you need to be looking. Um, I spent too long on a job that didn't make me happy, and um, being able to uh, starting a new job was one of the best days of my adult life. Switching industries into into this entertainment industry that I've loved for so long was just wonderful. Um, so you you need to make sure that you find something that makes you happy. Um, but yeah, no, I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up, whenever that is. I started, I went into college for IT and ended up in retail sales where I found I had a real talent for it. Um, and sales makes me happy. Being able to do sales inside the industry makes me even happier. Um, so it, it, there's it, everybody's got a unique path, but you you need to be self-aware of of what is going to bring you joy. Uh, and, you know, you, and it takes it sometimes you have to deliberately step back and go, is this what I want to be doing? And, and self-reflection is a really important part, and having trusted people around you who you can ask that question to do i seem happy at what i'm doing that's a it's a big question and having people that you trust who can say you don't seem that happy lately is you know the feedback is is great and um so i'm a big believer in, in finding your tribes it, it it is harder than it sounds sometimes i'm seeing peter responding to this it's you know, what makes you happy? It, it, it's hard. Um, waking up and not wanting to drag yourself out of bed for weeks at a time to go to a job is a really good indicator. Um, I mean, I got, I, I was in an IT job. I, I switched in the middle of my retail stuff, tried to go back into IT, ended up getting an ulcer. My body was telling me that it wasn't a good fit. Um, so there's waking up and, and wanting to do the job or, or finding that you drive joy, you know, on good basis. So even if you have an exhausting day going in going, man, I had an exhausting day, but it was worth it. Um, going ahead, exhaust a day and nothing will change. That's tough. But, you know, finding what makes you happy, again, it... it Self-reflection is, is hard, and it's hard to see past your own biases and anxiety at times, uh, which is why being able to ask a friend, you know, what they think of your state, of, of how you're doing, is important. 
um, just the lessons I've learned, you know, in, in my years as an ostensible adult. Well, and sometimes the job is good, but the people in it, there's a, a not productive or not uh, healthy uh, workplace culture. And, and, you know, sometimes you need to distinguish between, you know, if you're doing something you enjoy, but not with people you enjoy, uh, or people who don't respect you, um, you know, that's a different way that you have to make a, a course correction than if you're in a position where, you know, maybe you, you're, you're fine with the people you work with, you just, you know, it's mind numbing every day to do the work that you're doing, or, you know, um, maybe it's not the lifestyle that you want. Um, you know, uh, one of the reasons that I like to bring up, um, you know, that there are these other career paths in the industry is because, you know, there is that idea that, you know, you get out of college and then you go tour or you go hop on a cruise ship for two years and, and, or, uh, or you get to design the Broadway around. show out of college. It, yeah. And, you know, it, <clears throat> different people have different things that will make them happy in life. Some people want to have uh, a family. Um, some people want to stay close to home. Um, some people want to have a, a better work-life balance. Um, in my case, I have dogs. I can't go on tour. Um, but, uh, you, you know, there are other ways to be in the industry without having to necessarily, you know, uh, make a, a, an emotional and mental sacrifice for it. Yeah, I'm a firm believer that everything in my life has happened for a reason. Um, the, like it took me, like I graduated in 2011 from college and I didn't land an actual full-time job until late 2017. Like all that time I was freelancing and making the connections, building the skills that eventually allowed me to have the job that I currently have. So again, that goes along with being flexible. Like you have to be open to the opportunities and you never know where they're gonna lead you to. So, me being the the old guy on on in the group, I finally remembered what I was gonna say, and then I wrote it down to make sure I didn't forget again. Um, and it's actually two things. So I'm gonna go in backwards order. One of the things that uh, Mike just mentioned that got very close to what I wrote down before he said it was, we all want to feel valued in that position. It may not be the most stimulating job for that project but we want to be appreciated and feel valued as a member of the team. And I used to have a client, uh, I worked for a lending company. I did a lot of high-end social events. I did a lot of weddings and a lot of bar mitzvahs. I would have an event planner client who could not tell me what she wanted. She could only tell me what she didn't want. So I want blue up light. Well, what shade of blue? I don't know. So you'd put up, you know, R80. No, I don't like that. I don't like that. And you would go through that process until finally, it wasn't that she said, oh, I like that. It was just that she did not say, I do not like that. Maybe figuring out what makes you happy is a process of saying, I don't know what makes me happy, but I know what make, does not make me happy. And here are the things. Um, I would say listen to my podcast if you want to hear about my own personal journey of leaving a national company that I didn't feel appreciated by. Um, but I will say when we started this question, um, what I loved about lighting was creating the art. I loved when I was on tour with wrestling, creating an entrance that got a crowd to go crazy about to see a performer. And when I started to shift towards rigging, it took some time for me to realize that there was art in engineering. So I didn't want to give up the art. 
that is what my that that's what my passion is but it took some time for me to recognize the different art that I was being exposed to. Um, how do you start but not from the college route is a question that just came in. Um, there are a lot of ways to do it. I, I don't know if you guys have any uh, specifics. Um, I can tell you that some of my guests on my podcast who did not go to college are some of the best riggers I've ever worked with. Um, we had a question which was, how much on the job training or learning did you experience when you got your first job? Um, as an employer, I will tell you, I would rather have someone who has passion and dedication and no skill than someone who has all the skill and has no passion or dedication. Because I can teach you the skill. I can teach you how to rig. I can teach you the math. I can't teach you to want to be doing it. So that would be my answer. You know, I, I, again, I would say that, you know, there are a lot of companies that are looking for, for people and are willing to train them. Um, you know, the hard part is finding finding people, uh, as Ethan said, who are, are passionate about it. Um, but, uh, you know, in every, uh, every position I've worked in, you know, we've always had a, a problem finding, um, finding people who wanted to do that type of work. Um, you know, when I was with an AV integrator, you know, it, you get like resumes in from people who, you know, wanted to do like car stereos. And it, it, you know, you don't realize how much uh, business those those firms do. And some of it's theater, some of it's not. Some of it's corporate AV, some of it's uh, um, um, some of it's entertainment, some of it's sports. Um, you know, some of it's uh, you know higher ed uh, lecture halls and classrooms and stuff. But um, you know, it, it a lot of the skills are. Are, are very similar. There's drafting, there's design, there's project management. Um, you know, there's um, the the physical installation of everything, and you know, working with clients. Um, and you know, there's also the the need for having people who can who can provide training to end users. You know, I know that um, this goes back a couple of years, but um, you know, I know for a while, Mainstage had a really hard time finding somebody who was really excited about consoles and could train people how to use consoles, um, which is something that they have to do on all their projects. And, you know, that is both a training position and it's a sales position, um, you know, because it, and, and they, those feed off of each other. The ability to, to help clients navigate through a problem is inherently a a sales effort as well as a design effort, um, you know. So, so, you know, if if you are not getting traction, getting you know into the industry by sending resumes to theaters, just don't forget that there's all these other options out there that are you know that one side step away that you can do, um, you know, to your heart's desire, and then use that as a stepping stone into the next role that you want. Yeah, I would say explore opportunities in your area. Like I was fortunate enough between my junior and senior year of high school to intern at a small roadhouse, like one town over. Um, it was kind of their off season, so they didn't have too many shows going on, but that gave me a lot of like one-on-one -on -one time with the TD. So I was able to you know, get some hands-on lighting fixtures that I hadn't experienced before that my high school didn't have. Um, learned to drive a scissor lift for the first time. That was fun. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of opportunities. You just need to like, just start looking for them and get your name out there. Like so that, something might not come of it, but like companies always hang on to resumes and business cards if they think that they might have a position in the future. 
So it's always worth sending that stuff out. Yeah, my uh, start at Universal uh, was a little interesting. Well, a little different than starting a normal full-time job because I started as an intern and then um, I showed my passion and interest in the theme parks and the live entertainment in theme parks through my internship. Um, and because of that, they made the box for me. Um, but even in a new position, uh, just showing your interest in learning about it. Um, like, I mean, like I said, I had never been to a theme park before. So I took the time to ask like, hey, is there someone I can reach out to in the park so that I can learn about these live entertainment attractions, how they operate? Can I shadow someone for a day so I can go see the backstage areas and understand how all of this works? So while I'm trying to build this attraction for a different park, um, I have at least that little bit of knowledge from my, my day where I shadowed someone else. So, you know, using the resources you have around you to learn about what you're passionate about. So, I don't know if any of you have had to deal with this. I know Dave kind of has in, in, in talking about his career path, but how have you each individually dealt with when you lose that quote unquote spark, when the, the shininess of that job or that week or that project has gone away? How do you stay committed and how do you see it through to the other side? Uh, like a cornered animal, I dig my heels in and I, I, I start uh, batting at the walls. Uh, you know, it, it depends. It depends if the, you know, the lost passion is something that's, you know, coming from something that is uh, a job related issue or if it's something that's coming from personal life. Um, you know, uh, I've had it both ways where, you know, uh, the work was good and I was excited about it, but I was burnt out. I was burnt out because I was doing it too much or when I would go home, I'd still be thinking about it and I would never give myself that permission to turn that off. Um, and I found that um, when I start to get burnt out, what I need to do is I need to do things like go out running. I need to, uh, um, you know, spend some time screwing around with painting, which I'm not good at. Um, but uh, is is something that is exciting for me that I can kind of mess around with that lets me turn my brain off. Um, and, you know, like go hiking with my dogs or something or go hang out at the beach. Um, you know, those things all allow me, you know, in my, my personal life to hit that kind of like pause button and and let me be more refreshed when I'm, I'm coming into work. Um, and then, you know, work-wise, um, you know, I tend to, when the work isn't good, there's usually a reason for that. And I tend to be pretty uh, arrogant in trying to course correct that, um, you know, and sometimes that's something that I need to do about, you know, what's in my direct orbit of control. Sometimes that's something that I need to communicate up the food chain to my boss, sometimes my boss's boss, um, you know, sometimes my boss and uh, I together will communicate with the boss's boss or across the company or whatever. And, you know, it's there. The, the, the one thing that I've learned I can't do is I can't just sit idly by and just like, you know, like let things play out because uh, I would go insane. I will say one of my, my surefire spark rest restoration techniques has been trade shows, going to places like uh, the NAM show when it's being able to held in Anaheim, going to USITT, uh, LDI. Um, I love the energy. I, I particularly love the energy at places like USITT when you've got all these college students there who are really excited. And it, it's positive. It's, it's a whole lot of excitement. And I just eat it up. Um, and it, it really helps me to go back and go, this is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm in this industry. This is why I enjoy this. And it's a reminder like that sometimes that really does help 
when you lose that spark. And sometimes it just, I have to consciously recall that feeling to the best of my ability. Why am I doing this? Why am I here? And it's, being, it's being relit by others. Yeah. You need a tribe, a community to help you. I have yep. been, there's been a number of times I've asked my friend to, hey, could you just kick my ass for a bit? Um, just verbally and get, get me in gear again. Um, my motor's just, I've just stalled out. And um, I have a couple of pretty good friends who are more than willing to be motivational one way or another. And they they have helped me a lot. And, and being open and honest um, and it really helps. And um, I, I like something that my bosses and I do. We do a same page meeting every week. What's, go what's going on and making sure everybody's on the same page. But it's also a chance to, I think the one of the early ones is we feel like you've been drinking from a fire hose. Like we've been throwing all this stuff at you. We're pretty sure you're overwhelmed. And I'm just like, mm hmm. And, and we work through a number of ways to kind of um, either throw stuff into the future, not to worry about it now, or that's really not yours, or we can move this to someone else, or um, the boss themselves in some cases took took a couple of loads off my shoulders till I could find my bearings. And it helps, you know, being able to be um, having a support system in place. But it does happen. Um, and I've had it happen both just from a creative sense and a, a physical well-being sense. Um, and And they are hard to crawl out of. You got to take care of yourself. I will say that. I, I can't emphasize that enough. If you're not feeling good, if, if you're if you're not taking care of your body, it really makes it hard to do what you love. And um, so don't neglect your body or don't push yourself too hard. I think our one of our panelists from yesterday was like, I stretch before we, we get into doing physical things. And that helps. I haven't damaged my body the way a lot of my coworkers have over the years. And that's really good advice. Because um, a spark, losing your spark can be more than just mental or creative energy. It's also physical energy. Um, so keep an eye on that. Um, I know a lot of my advice tends to be introspection. But you can use a lot of uh, resources to, to help you. And, you know, sometimes you do need to see a professional. You, you know, you need to talk to a uh, therapist or a, a counselor of some kind. Um, I, I know several friends um, and people who, uh, you know, take medication to, to help them. And that's okay. That is absolutely okay. We're all different. Um, to... You know, there's there's just lots of different ways that you can to deal and, and work through it, but recognizing it is important. Um, on the theme park side of things, you know, the, the live entertainment attractions are very similar to normal theater, except for they're on a much longer timeline. Um, so I've been working on the same project now for over three years. And a lot of the work can often be in the office at a desk in front of the screen, checking emails, and it can get pretty mundane um, at times. But um, what I've learned to do is take a trip into the park. I haven't gone and ri ridden any of these rides in a while. Let's see how people react for the first time that they're riding it. Um, the the sh like the shock on their faces, the excitement on their faces, like how these people are enjoying um, something that I'm currently working on creating for another park. I mean, the same goes for, for normal theater, like go see a show, like be amazed by what is happening on stage in front of you, see the reactions of the people around you. Um, I've found that that helps light my spark when I'm having a hard time. Yeah, this isn't necessarily like losing passion per se, but work-life balance is a major thing. Um, one of the things that I realized early on when I was freelancing was 
I would spend the day in the theater or a theater or whatever and come home and start drafting or going over paperwork for a light plot. And I would sit at my desk from the time I got home to almost the time I went to bed. And like I was burning the candle at both ends. So I made a rule for myself that at the very least, I couldn't do any work while I was eating dinner. So like anytime I was eating a meal, work was off limits. Like you have to watch a show that you want to watch or read an article that doesn't have anything to do with your job. Um, and that's something that helped me. It was a small change, but it was something that really helped me get through like those really super busy times. I have said many times I had a, an argument with a, a former coworker of mine about a project and he was getting heated, you know, screaming that, you know, do your job. And my response was, well, it's my job and it may even be a career, but it is not my life. Um, I have forced myself to maintain the mentality that I will walk away from any job. If I need to earn money, I'll ask, is that off of what street or do you want fries with that? But what I do to earn a living is not the only thing that is going to define me. Now, it helps when you enjoy it and you have passion. And I mean, I got to do a project where I moved a mercury capsule. I would have done that for free because it was so cool and I got so much out of it. So that's a great thing when you have those opportunities, but it, it, that shouldn't be the only thing that defines you. So walking away, being able to, to get perspective is never a bad thing. Um, and it may actually help you be better at your job. We, we work in an entertainment industry that demands that we get something done, the show must go on safely and at all expenses, except that's not the truth. If the show doesn't happen, no one's dying. No one is, you know, going to be homeless because we didn't do that one show or it got delayed by 10 minutes. Um, sometimes what you need is perspective. So. Can I just uh, add one thing there? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think there's this illusion that, um, you know, we have in the arts that everything you need to do needs to be driven by inspiration. And, you know, part of, of the difference between having a hobby and having a career or a profession is, uh, you know, putting, figuring out the things that inspire you to do good work and applying a structure on that because you're not always going to have that inspiration, uh, but you still have to deliver a work product for your clients. And, you know, uh, it, it really helps to uh, identify and, and apply structure to a, a process for running your, your, uh, your design or, or uh, um, production um, work through that um, you know keeps you on a track. Because um, if you don't, if you're not tethered to something, then those days when you don't feel that inspiration, now you're just kind of like freewheeling it around, and um, that becomes uh, uh, much more untenable. All right. Well, we are at the end of our official time, but you know, like everything else. The show's running long. Um, if there are any other questions that the, the viewers want to post, we'll, we'll try to get to them and, and answer them or any off topic things or, or whatever. We'd more than happily uh, stick around for a few more minutes or you can all disappear and go off to whatever you're doing next. And while we wait for those, potential questions to or not to come in. I'll say uh, thank you to the panelists for, again, spending some time uh, from your busy schedules to talk. Um, it is one of the great things of our industry is those who give back and, and want to see others succeed. And uh, without any direct 
benefit themselves except for knowing that they've helped the industry that has helped them. Okay, just as a fun personal question, why did you all want to get into this industry? That's a good question. So I got dragged into the theater my sophomore year of high school to run the light board for the fall musical. Um, and when I say theater, I mean a gymatorium with no fly system, no like the school wouldn't let me touch the curtains, couldn't move anything except the lights. And I was programming on a desk that was um, just three years younger than me. So it was interesting and parts of it didn't work. Um, and my only instruction was from the senior student who was obviously outgoing because um, the band director who oversaw the auditorium specifically told us that he didn't want to know how anything worked. So I, there was no help there. Um, so it was a lot of self-taught um, skills, like just building off of what the senior had taught me. Um, and the next year I was designing the musical myself and I just fell in love with it. and thought it would be a good idea to go study it in college. I saw my freshman year, I saw Into the Woods that my high school had put on and I was blown away. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Like it's, it's really like one of the first theater shows I had seen since I was really little. Like I, I was never really into theater all that much. Um, I was like, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of the people on stage, the family that is created, um, you know, through the cast and the crew and all that stuff. So I was like, I'm going to audition. And I auditioned for like three or four shows. And I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> like, I, I am not meant to be on stage whatsoever. Um, and one of my good friends, well, uh, my friend Marissa Abbott, if anyone knows her, uh, he uh, was in my health class. Um, sophomore year and she's like hey if you don't get into the next show try tech with me I was like okay and that's where it all started <laughs> uh, I fell absolutely in love with it and it it took my creative side and my artsy side and put it together with theater and it, it was great that's, that's how I got into it my family was always engaged with the arts uh older brother was into music so I would always go to his concerts um uh, my older sister was the same way and, you know, all these concerts were held in like a 1930s, 1940s era, you know, uh, um, you know, concrete box of an auditorium. Uh, and, um, you know, it's fun working in a space that is not a very workable space because you learn to improvise a lot. Uh, and you learn to draw outside the lines. And, um, you know, a lot of the, the fun of that was, you know, just all of the creativity that we were able to throw into to doing different things. And so, you know, as I was in, my interest started in middle school and then, you know, kind of took off as I was getting into high school. Um, I just, I really love the hands-on part of it and being able to, you know, make something out of nothing. Um, and I, I think any, if I, if I had to be doing something that wasn't theater, it would be a, a similar thing where I'm, I'm doing something where I'm, I'm making something that didn't exist in the world before. That's always been interesting to me. Second grade, elementary school, watching the sixth grade play. And I knew right there and right then, there is no freaking way they were getting me on that damn stage. But there was a sixth grader running the follow spot in the, in it, again, gymatorium. So it was in the storage room and he was on a platform with a single follow spot and that's it. And I said, I'll do that. 
I'll more than happily do that. That was it. That was my first memory of getting into the business. And uh, again, similar to Alicia, I didn't get into theater until my junior year of high school. I had done a lot of photography. Um, my father was a uh, optical engineer and did large format optics, spy cameras and spy planes. So he was a photographer. I grew up learning that stuff. That kind of led into the lighting side once I started doing theater. And that's what I gravitated towards. And then I uh, just said, hey, I, I like doing this. Oh, what? I can make money? Sweet. I can leave my parents' house, never come back? Even better. So um, I'm going to ask one more question, which I think is a great question for us to potentially end on. But I'm going to remind uh, some of the viewers, if you haven't already, and uh, Peter, who has been posting here, he joined yesterday. Um, all of us are members of a community called controlbooth.com. It is a great resource in the entertainment industry and outside of it. We have a Discord where we talk about a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with the entertainment industry. Maybe a lot to do with grilling meat, which is also a really good thing in the world. Um, or if you're a vegetarian, interject grilling something else. Um, so check out controlbooth.com. It's a great resource. It has a great wiki. It's uh, populated by both uh, amateurs and professionals. Like myself as a professional, we have amateurs, we have teachers. It's a great resource when I mentioned that. So this question is posed again by Peter who stole it from another session, but I think it's a great one. What is your professional superpower and what makes you and your work unique and successful compared to everyone else? The ability to uh, to do research and then, you know, in, interpret it and then disseminate it to clients. Um, you know, there's a translation that has to happen there between, you know, what's the, the science or the facts or whatever of something and then making that something that the client can find to be digestible in a way that's meaningful to them and to the success of what they're trying to do. Um, you know, and the, the research is a big, a, 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 you know, magnificently huge thing of, of what I do is, you know, and I can be replaced by anyone who knows how to drive a search engine. Um, you know, if you can throw stuff into Google and you know how to use other resources within the, within the industry to get answers to things, I mean, you can go a long way. And um, I uh, attribute a lot of the success that I've had with my, my projects and my clients to that ability of being able to go out and find information that I didn't have before, get a sense of the landscape of what it means, and then find a way to, uh, to make that something meaningful and actionable for a client. Oddly enough, I generally consider my superpower to be that I'm a jack of all trades. Um, I often have to warn whoever my new boss is, is that I have a bad tendency to to end up working on a number of different things. Um, I just like to bounce around between various disciplines. Um, IT, e-commerce, it all ends up being interrelated. E-commerce always winds up at a weird intersection between sales, marketing, IT, search engine optimization. It's like all these multidisciplines distilled down um, into these positions. So I ironically, my superpower is that I'm a master of none of them, but I'm good enough to converse on all of them. Um, so that's <laughs> the irony of my superpower. Uh, if you asked one of my coworkers, they'd say soldering based on the multiple LED projects that we've had for the past year or so before the pandemic uh, hit. Um, but other than that, uh, I would say organization. Um, I have a, I would say I'm like just shy of being in love with Excel spreadsheets. And like, that's how I plan um, all the stuff that I need to do to put in a show. 
like where circuits are coming from, where the DMX is coming from, or like how many feet of LED tape I need for this thing or that thing, and just have it do math for me. Um, yeah, I'd say organization is my one of my strong suits. For me, I think my superpower would be my uh, attention to detail and ability to plan ahead. Um, like just to, to think of everything like, okay, we need to do this event. I think, okay, this person's gonna need this thing. Like say we're going, we need to do a picnic at a park. Okay, we're gonna need a blanket, we're gonna need food. Who's invited? How are we getting there? Are we walking? Are we driving? Do we need to get gas? Like just thinking of everything that's absolutely needed ahead of time uh, and then making sure we have that so things can go smoothly. Um, I, yeah, that's definitely my superpower. All right, well, I'll take it home. I, I have two halves of my superpower. One is the giant emptiness in my brain that allows me to store a vast amount of useless information. And two, I, my business does a, a lot of rigging inspections and Where's Waldo was never a challenge for me. I am very good at find, visually finding outliers. So when I do an inspection, I can look at things that are just repetitive. You wanna fly 40 line sets in with six lift lines each, I can look at all those trim chains and I will find the one that has a cracked weld. It's just how my brain works. I see it and I go, hey, that one does not look the same. So that's it. And the gift of gab. Some say that's not a superpower, but maybe a curse. All right. Well, thank you everyone for uh, for viewing today. We're glad that you were here in some great questions. Thank you to the panelists. Um, and I guess there's not much more to say, but you know, maybe uh, next year we'll get to see each other in person. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.